<laughs> final talk, final keynote of the conference. <laughs> and this is what you can prepare. So, uh, Greg, uh, great that you want to um, to finish the conference. Um, I know you're going to do that in a, in a very uh, entertaining way, but also a very thoughtful way. Um, we uh, we have also came a long way and worked together in different projects and, and uh, contexts and. It has always been a pleasure um, um, to to listen to you and to understand your your brain a little bit. It's very difficult to understand <laughs> his brain, uh, but that you will probably find out during his talk. Um, uh, but it's uh, it's it's a pleasure. Um, it's been a pleasure always, and um, um, I'm looking forward to this talk, which will be different from the others, I'm sure. So uh, have fun, everyone. And uh, I'll be back after. <laughs> I'll be back. Thanks, Rob. Uh, that's very kind of you. Um, this is going to be a whistle top through tour through Greg's brain. Uh, <laughs> hope you can stay with me. Um, so nice to be here and have a chance to do it. I was, I was trying, I was adapting my my paper as, as the conference went along to try and pick up some of the themes that people were mentioning because I thought it might be quite good to be a bit of a summary and go on. So. Um, wow, it's a tough world. This is going to be. This is the toughest century in the history of mankind. So we're going to have to make some really interesting things. And I suppose the big question is, what, what's the best way to predict the future? Um, well, I, don't, I think what's the only thing we know is it's going to take radical change. This is just a really basic graph of. of basically earth share on one side and time on the other and it doesn't look good we need one and a half planets now by the end of the century we probably need three planets and that's going to be quite difficult and when you actually look at who's to blame well we're all to blame you know this, these are these are the um, you can see I've marked with little arrows key countries of people here Australia Holland because there seem to be a lot of people from Holland here and uh, United Kingdom, and it doesn't look good. When, when the Gabon is above its Earth, is, is using more than its um, ecological footprint, you realize it's really, 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 really serious. And I had this idea of, for the UK, a factor four urbanism, half as much, twice sufficiently, you know, twice effectively. And, and but the problem is with Australia, we're already at factor six. So, you know, this is the Earth overshoot day. You can look at your country on here and find out when you've used up your fair share of resources <laughs> for the Earth. And, and you can see it's painful. 31st of March, just after my birthday, Australia's already used up its, each Australian's used up their share of the planet. By the time you get to, to May the 8th, the United Kingdom's used up its side, its share of the planet and it goes on and on and on and, and there isn't a country on there that manages to get to the end of the year and I think the amazing thing about Australia I said how a continent has become a country you know you start off with the, the red line the big bottom bottom is the UK uh, ecological footprint the Australian one is just above that and at one time you had 30 global hectares of person in Australia and you were hovering around eight or so global hectares, and it was just, you were living on a continent, and what you realize, as the population's increased and your carrying capacity has stayed, got a bit smaller, um, and, your populate, and your needs have grown a bit, it's getting to the point where eventually you're gonna be a country like everyone else and not a continent. It's quite an interesting um, problem. And when you look at the, how does it meet urbanism? Well, this is the ecological footprint of London. And it's 293 times <coughs> the area of London. And where is the ecological footprint? It's all over the world. You know, it's asparagus from Peru, it's oil from Saudi Arabia, it's you know oranges from from Spain. It's all over the place. <coughs> and I think that's a real challenge how we change that. And my idea is that we we have to develop a sort of more sort of bio-based urbanism somehow, seeing the city slightly differently from a series of, seeing it as an 
from an aesthetic thing and a, a, even a people thing to a, to a system of processes, a sort of super organism. And I think when everyone thinks about biometric design, they think of all these lovely things, don't they, like abalone shells and that curly broccoli stuff and Fibonacci series on, on um, sunflowers and these, these little sea slugs and things, but there's also stuff like this, <laughs> you know, which, you know, it's not an aesthetic thing. These things are just as good in their environment as the other things. Just because they don't look quite as nice doesn't mean they're not amazing creatures. The echidna has its knees on backwards, which is quite interesting, you know. Um, and so, and so, I, and I, and so, so I think what you realise is that our, our knowledge of, of ecology is sadly lacking. It's, it's amazing that, that ecology wasn't... Um, Joseph Priestley, who comes from Salford in Manchester, where, where I come from, you know, he was the first person to realise that you actually, that there were actually different gases in the air and that it seemed that plants and animals had to get together because he put, he put a mouse and a candle in a big bell jar and next day they were both dead. He was like, ooh, interesting. <laughs> and then he put a mouse, a candle and some plants in the same jar and the next day they were still alive. And he was like, ooh, interesting. So he realised there was something to do with animals and plants and, and that's only 200 years ago. We've, and, it, and it took another, another 50 years before we really understood that there was that, that what um, James Lovelock's saying here is that life isn't an individual thing. It's, it's actually an ecological thing. It's sort of, we live in our, in our own sort of biospace. And so I'm more interested in the idea of synergies. This is a hydra, which is actually two plants. It's a way for a plant and an animal. The animal lives inside the plant. They, they reproduce at exactly the same time and eat each other's excrement. So they get on quite well, but, you know. So and, and I think we probably need to think more synergistically about how we put things together. And so, and I suppose this idea of the city as a super organism, if it's like a, a beehive or a wasp nest or an ant's nest or something, then we've got to think about it as if it's a living thing and not just say it's a super organism. You know what I mean? And therefore, if it is a living thing, it's got to obey the same rules of evolutionary development that living things obey. And I think that's really interesting. And the, the key things in evolutionary development are modularity, that living things are made of <coughs> small things that join together, whether that's fingers, toes, or cells, or whatever. And of course, modularity, we can see that in the city, in streets, and neighborhoods, and so on. And then, there's this idea of development of plasticity. Things, every individual is a product of its own environment. So it shapes, it's shaped by the forces that sit around it. And that's what I worry when we, when we have a lot of, one of the great things about globalization is we get to share ideas, but when we're all using the same idea, probably not located enough. And I think that's a, a challenge. And, and when you get into evolutionary development, it's quite interesting. You know, there, there are key themes in there which I think could, could really help with urbanism. The first one is exaptation. One of the classic exaptations is, is feathers that were invented first for dis display and then used to invent wings with. You know, and so how can we take some element of something that was designed for something else and use it in a better way to do something else? It's quite an interesting idea and you'll see that in my work as we go. And from that to the spandrel, which is, which is this idea, a function that develops from the evolution of an element aimed at another adaptation. So that's a, an in-between. So here I've, we've got an idea of something that protects for floods, but also allows is productive in terms of producing food in this case, in, in the space that might be used, meanwhile space for absorbing flood or something. And then Atavism is quite interesting where hidden <coughs> genetic code reappears and creates mutation and things. And it'd be really interesting how maybe some of the things that cities have in their history might be able to be used in a clever way to 
invent the future. In, in this case, the, the manufacturing facilities of Salford, which are now empty, were used to create these biodomes to protect us from climate change. <coughs> and then I really like phenotypic plasticity. This is the idea that the genotype and the phenotype are slightly different things. The genotype is generic. The phenotype grows and gets mutated by the forces that surround it. And I was thinking of Luke's presentation about his work and how he uses the sun to derive the section and form of the building as, as a sort of phenotypic plasticity, something where it mutates according to climatic things. And then the final thing is, is this idea of vestige, where things that, that apparently were useless get used again. You know, so in this case, this was a project we did in Dublin where we, we used high-speed boats on the, on the canal network to connect other bits of, of um, mobility's infrastructure to get people around the city quicker. And so we've got to think more holistically. You know, we often, we, we talk about the, the word silo, but we sit there and we design buildings with loads of insulation in that everyone drives to. You know, it's like crazy. You know, we really have to start thinking holistically. And <coughs> like, the sustainable city is going to be pet free. Look at the ecological big hitters of London. Meat eating <laughs> is number one, right? So I'm a vegetarian. That's quite good. So I'm not on the first one. Number two, pet food. The second biggest impact in the whole of London is pet food. Right? And I would say we're trying to invent solar buildings, but a solar dog would be really easy. <laughs> Wouldn't it? Well, and solar cars are impossible, but solar dogs, we can do that tomorrow. They can let, give everyone a little electric dog. Oh, my dog's vegan, so I'm okay. Anyway, but, and then milk drinkings, number three. And then all the transport is number four. You know, we, we have to look at the big picture. You know, and, and we somehow have to get more for less. We keep designing one function systems which do one thing quite well and don't care about anything else they could possibly do or not. And we know how much we have to multitask. We need a multitasking city that can, where everything we put in it does loads of stuff. And, you know, and we, we've got to sort of make synergies. I, I was, and, 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 and where this comes from, it comes from an idea of, of design because you take this, you know, this is a, a rat, okay, and it's dead, obviously, but obviously, and, but, but actually, if, 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 you, if you ask what the difference is between that and that, this is, this is the rat minster, right, okay? So, so if, if, you, if you think about that, what is the difference between, between that and the mincemeat? There is actually no physical difference. There's the same amount of fat, same amount of protein, same amount of water, right? But actually, what the difference is that there's order here in this. This has order. And that's what we create when we design cities. We, we create order. And it's the order that makes the mincemeat turn into a living, breathing, intelligent thing. So we need to invent order. And I suppose one of the things that both of Andy and Rob said about urbanism is where's the order you know how do you plan things how do you make things happen and the orders we need are in the rat are really complicated that rat's super intelligent yeah yeah and yeah it's just mincemeat and the city can be the same thing if we stop making mincemeat and start making living things they'll be intelligent they'll be able to adapt to situations because that's what intelligence is it's the ability to adapt it's a sensory adaptation phenomenon and so I'm going to go through some, some little projects to get us in the, in the mood for it. Um, this was quite interesting because I was working in this place called Nelson in Lancashire. Never go there. Um, it's worth avoiding. <laughs> um, because it has 65% unemployment. right? And they wanted us to make a sustainable neighborhood. And I said, 65% unemployment is never sustainable. You know, so it doesn't matter what we do to the houses. So, and I, and, I, and so I was trying to explain it to them because 
they, they really didn't want to know. And um, I said, you think that sustainability is doing this, yeah? <laughs> Take the houses, put photovoltaics on the roofs. And I said, it sort of is, but I said, it's what you do with the energy that comes off those photovoltaics. Because what well, I said, for example, this lovely hill here, I decided to freeze it with some snow guns, which are powered by the electricity, that turned it into an Olympic ski resort, and then used the waste heat from the snow guns to heat the town. So you got free heating and an Olympic ski resort, which you can get to by train from Manchester in 25 minutes, which would be very nice for my snowboarding career. You know, and, 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 you know, and I think we have to start thinking really imaginatively about the new possibilities of sustainability instead of looking at the problem solving of sustainability. Because I've been telling people about the problem solving of sustainability for 30 years and no one's played a blind bit of notice with, with any power. We've got to start showing the amazing futures that we can have by using sustainable things. I, I did a project <coughs> with, with um, McDonald's and um, McDonald's is quite interesting and I'm not going to talk about the project so much but I'm just going to sh show you the effect of, that change can have on things. If you look at McDonald's obviously as a vegetarian I've never eaten a McDonald's burger so I, I, people tell me they don't taste of anything which is really bizarre when, it, when I looked at the ecological impact of them. Um, but if, if you actually look at the size of a McDonald's, that's a, that little red dot, that's, some, that's, that's how much space you need to produce all the food for one McDonald's in a year. And the interesting thing is if you stack it up, they wanted to do a sustainable McDonald's, if you stack it up on, on the site, it's as an urban farm, people are interested in urban farms, it's 30 kilometres tall, <laughs> right? So you've got to start like, on, on, in this place in Liverpool where we're looking, on a, it was, there was a derelict uh, sort of 26 hectare site behind the, behind the proposed McDonald's and it's a, a 30 storey urban farm on there with a giant M on it. It looks great. But the interesting thing is, imagine if you made the burger out of something else, just one thing. Keep everything else, just make the burger out of something else. If you make a goat burger, <laughs> it shrinks massively. And if, you're a, if you do a veggie burger like me, you're in, you're in look, at, look at the veggie burger, McDonald's, it's tiny, we can all have one in every city. It's only a kilometre high, it's the same size, it's the same size as the burge. Every, every McDonald's will be a miniature burge with, with, you know, vegetables growing in it. And you know what I mean, and, and that's really, really interesting because you start to understand the future is vegetarian. You might as well get used to it. You eat, you know, <coughs> the future is vegetarian, it's probably vegan actually, but maybe vegetarian with a small amount of Parmesan cheese, just <laughs> to keep it interesting, we we'll could probably do it, but, but we're going to have to change, because there is no solution to a meat-based diet on this planet with, with 10 billion people, we've got to face it. And every project you do, you should be saying, how do I make these people be vegetarian when I'm doing this project? How can I make it happen? Because it's got to happen. It's the biggest thing you can do. And this project was, was really interesting because uh, we were working with Liverpool City Council and we did a range of... Liverpool City Council came to me and said, we want to be sustainable by 2050, but we've got no money, no expertise, and we don't really care. <laughs> so, but we have to do it. So how do we do it? And so we did a range of projects for them. This is, this is one I, I presented at the last SASPI, which, which is about what happens if you decided to power the city with biological, with biological means. So in, the, in this case, we're looking at algae. Algae is really interesting because it's basically water-based plants. And instead of producing wood, they fill themselves with oil to keep themselves buoyant. So they're, they're, they're about, some of them are 40, 50% by weight oil. And because they're, they keep growing and you can just hoover them off the surface of the water, they don't shade themselves, so they have this continual production cycle. So there so they could be a really good way of making the future happen. And the yield typically is 100 <coughs> times that of having rapeseed and 50 times that of palm oil. So it could save the, the rainforest too. And the interesting thing about Liverpool is, as, as a Manchester United fan, um, 
I always smirk a little bit about about the sadness of Liverpool, but it but it's quite a sad sad story since Manchester built the Manchester Ship Canal that bypassed Liverpool's docks and uh, bankrupted Liverpool. Um, we did enjoy that, but it's not done much for the city of Liverpool. And 12% of all space, it's lost half its population since the Second World War, so it's really struggling. And you can see all the houses are. They pay artists to make the boards for the houses, so, so when you board up the windows, they look quite good. People, people can look at the, at the boarded up houses because they're quite a nice piece of art. But it is quite a, a, a difficult space to be in that. And it makes it, CABE, which is the Commission for Architecture and the Built Environment in the UK, said space is a luxury in the modern city. Well, not in Liverpool, it's a liability. You know, um, sort of, Public transport is collapsing because people live too far apart for the buses to work, so everyone gets a taxi. It's really complicated. But it's interesting, if you want to power the whole of Liverpool with rapeseed, okay, how big is the farm? Well, it's the size of that red area, but actually, if you, it, you'd have to take every single field in all the red and green areas of that map and grow rapeseed on them just to, just to provide the energy each year for Liverpool. So biofuels are not really the answer. But if you decide to do algae, you can, I have this idea that you could, you could float algae rays in the estuary, protect the city from storm surge, and by recycling glass around Europe, by using the old port to bring glass to the, unrecycled glass to the city, I could make loads of algae arrays, which are basically very shallow tanks with a glass roof. And then I'd sort of make an algae array, make more energy, make more glass, make another algae array, make more energy, get another glass factory going, and keep going until I'd made a big enough algae array that would, that would power Liverpool. And I'd grow it over 40 years. And then I realized that when you start looking at the algae, you, you get the algae, you produce oil with it, but you get waste from it, and the waste is cellulose, it's really good for feeding to cows. So I thought, oh, we can have cows in the mix. So I got some cows, and then they produce waste, and I realized the greenhouse would be quite handy because I could use the waste from the cows to, to fertilize the greenhouse. And then I started thinking about where you could sequester the CO2 from the cogeneration plants that I was powering, and then that went into the algae arrays in the greenhouse. I got this amazing virtuous cycle. And I realized that in a relatively short length of time, by sort of growing this, I, I could, by 20, just on a, on a relatively small scale production, I could end up producing more power than Liverpool needed, but also become a net exporter of oil by 2050, just when everyone else has run out of it. You've got biodiesel coming out of your ears in Liverpool. <laughs> and, in, and this is how big it is. It looks beautiful, doesn't it? Here's, here's the Mersey estuary. I've turned this round, so this is north this way. Here's Birkenhead, this is Liverpool here. And here are the floating algae rays, all here, right out here. And it looks big, but it's, in 40 years, it, it grows about the same size as, as Europort has grown in the last 40 years in Rotterdam. So it must be possible. And it sort of looks beautiful. And it's so, it's so much free heat, you get under lawn heating in every garden. So, when, so you can have a barbecue when it's snowing. <laughs> it's just so easy. And then all the derelict spaces get filled in with greenhouses to produce the, the food and everything, so it's quite beautiful. And I think that urban farming, has, I think, is going to be a key thing, and this, the scale of it is going to be quite interesting in the future. Um, I did a project, you can see this is a very old project, which called called the Sunflower House, where I thought if, you, if I could do a passive house that heated, in, heated itself, this one does it because it's got a greenhouse at the bottom, and the houses track the sun in little towers. And the heat from the greenhouse would rise up the tower and heat all the, the apartments. And then, but the greenhouses would grow sunflowers. So the building's like giant sunflowers, and the, we're growing sunflowers, and we get diesel oil, and you get a car share with the, with the, with the house where you could drive 10,000 miles, and then it was an A-class Mercedes 1.7 diesel. Um, and that was quite nice. And then, then I started thinking about, could I make a house that not only heated itself and powered the car, but also fed itself? So we did the invisible terrace, which is quite an interesting thing. Things had improved. We had a 
0.7 litre diesel in the smart car, so that, was, that got us to 80 miles per gallon, so we need less thing. We had an algae around the roof that powered that. We had food in the garden, in the facade. Um, we had in the back garden, we had three pigs to eat the, the old food, 11 chickens, so you get enough eggs to power, keep a family of four going. Um, there's, and there's like, a, there's this interseasonal store in the floor, which is full of water that has tilapia in, where you feed them with some other waste food, so you can go fishing. You see a guy fishing under the stairs there, <laughs> catching them. <laughs> and you can, and in an incredibly small amount of space, you can you can basically be be pretty much um, sustainable. You know, it all stacks up. So, you know, and, and so I, th I think that'd be really interesting in the future. In this project, I was trying to link two neighbourhoods and make the neighbourhood carbon neutral at the same time. So th this park is covered in short coppice willow, and the short coppice willow then is harvested and, and burnt in a cogem plant, and the carbon dioxide is then sequestered in these aqu aquaponic um, heliotropic arrays that produce food. So it was just, I think it was quite a nice project. This project's a real project because they've all been a bit, you know, far-fetched possibly. Um, this is the Biospheric Foundation. Um, one of my um, ex-students, um, Vincent Walsh, um, when he finished his master's, I said, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to squat in this building and take over the means of production and start the sustainable revolution. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, okay, Vinny, I'll see you, see you later. And then about a year later, he phoned me up and said, I've broken in, I'm in, it's freezing, are you ready to go? So, stu <laughs> so stupidly I said yes, and, and I went down there, this is the building in, in Salford, it's actually in the third poorest neighbourhood in Britain, so really nasty. So the first thing we did, we, we created a sort of a circular city of food, energy, water, with the, the building in the middle of it, with all the services that it does, so it's got things like reclaimed sawdust used to produce mushrooms, waste, um, heat from the building, powering a brewery, you know, loads of different stuff on there. And then when we started looking at the building, the building was built in 1947 out of waste materials from the war and was just about to collapse, which is why it was vacant. So it was a little bit dangerous in there, to be honest. And so we realized if we were gonna put some sort of food system in there, it would have to be relatively lightweight. And we really liked the idea of aquaponics. Um, aquaponics is a, a mixture of fish farming, I'm, a, I'm now a licensed fish farmer, um, and um, basically hydroponics. So basically you feed the fish, the fish produce waste, that, that's mainly ammonia and a bit of solid waste. The plants don't like ammonia, nothing really likes solid waste apart from worms, so then you, you then mineralize it, so you pass it through some bacteria which likes ammonia, which turns it into nitrate, and then you've got a really rich food source for plants. And, th and then you run that back, and then the water ends up back in the fish tank, and it's clean water for the fish so they don't die. So it's, it's really simple. And so we decided, we, we then um, got some money from the Manchester International Festival to do the project, which was a bit shocking because I'd just drawn a picture of it with some green stuff on the building. And they said, yeah, we'll go for it in six months' time. And I had to invent how to do aquaponics in, with that, without um, much knowledge, really. And then the, I said it's really important that I make the whole thing out of, out of stuff you can buy off eBay. <laughs> you know, because I thought if, if, I, if you could buy it all off eBay, <coughs> then anyone could make one. So I thought it would make it really open source. So, and but it had to be a, an exhibit. It was, it was meant to run for two weeks as an exhibition and a year as a laboratory. So it had to be a laboratory and an exhibition. So I managed to find 12 fish tanks on eBay that had been made the wrong size for someone. So I had, I had these huge fish tanks. So I had 12 of those. You see there's some tilapia in this one and there's some carp in this one. And then the water drained out of the fish tanks. It got pumped by these pumps. We, sat, we found some photovoltaic cells in, in a, that had been thrown away off, off another building that they'd done 10 years life. And they were, so we got those, so we were, we were carbon neutral. It was quite good. And the water gets pumped into this mineralization system that looks remarkably like some washing up 
balls. <laughs> um, took me ages to find green ones. Um, <laughs> and you can see there's little clay balls in there, and, and I made a homemade siphon, so the water siphoned through this thing, made you go to the toilet every time you're in the building. Um, and, and basically, air got in, so the processing of the, of the ammonia... Oh, don't know what's happened there. <laughs> We still going? Oh yes, we're still going. This is it. Clad stop evaporation, um, and then the water got pumped from there down the facade of the building through these um, bags made of silicon with fruiting crops in on the south facing windows. Um, see here, there's a pepper here growing quite well, and all the tomatoes. You can see how dangerous the neighbourhood is because there's there's bars on the second floor windows. <laughs> Just gives you some idea of, uh, of what the neighbourhood's like. Um, and then it gets pumped from there onto the roof where we have this huge polytunnel set on, set on a transfer beam and in that you can see that I bought loads of, made what's called a nutrient film system um, which, is, which basically was a load of plastic guttering which I bought off eBay with some plastic lids that I found that just about fitted it and, I, and a student said, I'd really like to come over to your farm and help you so he came over and he drew, drilled 7,000 holes for me Oh. <laughs> Never saw him again. <laughs> he was hoping to do some architecture, um, but it was a good job done. And then, the amazing thing is, we filled it up, put the fish in, and it started growing stuff. And, and what happened was, things grew really fast. We, we, we grew the plants organically, and we fed the fish organically, and then, so we're sort of organic, except there's no organic certification for, for um, aquaponic food production at the moment in the whole world, which is a bit of a shame really. Um, so these plants, they're, they're two days in the system, they're five days in the system. Oh. It went like crazy and then by, by the end of the fest festival, we, uh, yeah, we, we, we were ready to harvest the first crop. It's like incredible. Um, and we, we, we used um, companion planting, we, we read this book on um, Andy and Tilly, who helped me with it, were mad about um, permaculture, so they, they were demanding that we would companion plant. So we had 32 different crops, four different fish sort of things. Um, we had some worms, some um, snails, some crayfish, some limpets, and all sorts of things in the system, trying to make a really biodiverse system. And then we ran the system for a year, selling crops to restaurants and any crops that didn't look so good we had a pop-up shop at the bottom of the building where if you bought one of the what we what we found when we did a survey of the tower blocks next door to the building was that only 20 percent of the houses had a cooker there was no you couldn't buy a vegetable within a kilometer of the building basically everyone just ate tv dinners every single day so we set this pop-up shop up where, they, where you'd turn up and, and there were, we had to make recipe cards with meals because no one knew how to cook anything. And if you bought a recipe card and you bought the ingredients for that, you got free salad. <laughs> it was grown on the thing. Quite amazing, really. And so we have the, all the bits. The building's been demolished now, so we have all the bits in a, in a container ready to redeploy somewhere. If you, it's a shipping container. You could come to Australia if you want to. Um, and then we, we decided, I got, I got this money, I got the Green Genius Award, great title, uh, from the British government to produce a food producing facade. So I tried to minimise the system and we made a double skin facade that could ventilate in several ways that would use the, the sort of transpiration of plants to cool the building. And so we built a mock-up of it for the festival, here it is being built out of the drain pipes and stuff. And then we built a, a nicer one and put it in the facade and we found that it saved about, each square meter of facade saved about, about 100 pounds worth of energy for the building and also produced about 50 pounds worth of crops for the year. And yet it only costs about 300 pounds extra to do. So it's quite an interesting thing, but I don't know who will, who'd own a, a food producing office facade, I'm not sure. So, so what I did next, I, I did the super duper market <laughs> which is like it's like better than a supermarket because um, it's got it's made of a giant south facing um, food producing facade um, so we're, we're working with Waitrose at the moment on this 
and we're trying to get a mock-up of this where, because one, one of the things we found with the, with the um, Biospheric Foundation was that once you get past November in England, it's quite difficult to produce food out of any system. And the thing about the supermarket is it's got loads of waste heat. And it's generally got a co-gen plant, so at night they've got loads of spare electricity. So you could, you could light it all night, you could heat it all day and night. And then the other thing is there's loads of waste protein for the fish in the supermarket, in the waste streams. So you'd be able to hyper-localize that flow and produce stuff. And we reckon that a typical large-scale waitrose we can produce a million pounds worth of crops a year, quite easily. You know, we on a very conservative thing, so I'm trying to get them to do that at the moment. We've also made, we've designed a sort of mobile, deployable one. We're working with, this, with this people called Kandu, who look at First Nation tribes in, in Canada and work with them. And up near Edmonton, where the tar sands are, there's an incredible problem with soil pollution and all sorts of really sad issues. So we've, we've invented this sort of pop-up aquaponic farm where you can learn how to do it and then it moves off and then you can build a cheaper one yourself and we're trying to get that some money for that to be built at the moment. So things are really exciting. I thought I'd do it. This is the greatest hits run now. Just a few few little <laughs> projects that, that, that might interest you. Um, we'll, the project we actually did for, for Whitefield in Nelson wasn't quite as exciting as the 365 days of the year ski resort, unfortunately. <laughs> but what we did, we had a heritage neighborhood where Prince Charles interfered in the, in the planning process and wouldn't let us demolish it. So what we had to do, we had to, we, we, the houses became more valuable than Stonehenge because he put an emergency <laughs> listing on them so we couldn't change anything. And so we had to produce, and, and we'd already signed a, to make a carbon neutral neighborhood. So we made this, um, biodiesel fueled um, interseasonal store urbanism with this new public space that runs between the canal and the road that has had polluted land because it used to have a road works there. And we dug that out and put these um, seven sort of water tanks in there that, that get heated up in the summer from the, from the co-gem plant and de depleted in the winter. And, um, and that led us in a way to the projects Andy and myself have been working on over the last few years we have this um, Project Citizen, which is with the European Union. God bless them, after <laughs> Brexit. Um, <laughs> hopefully still there. I'm doing one more trip to Brussels on the, in February, just before, to, get, to do one last review for them before, before I get thrown into the uh, wilderness. Um, <laughs> but but um, and, and we've taken some of the ideas from the Nelson thing and taken further to, to, to look at at how we make places carbon neutral. What we do is we turn up in a place and in a week we try and understand the place and we try and have a goal of carbon neutrality for the city and, the and in particular the neighborhood. And we just work really fast having ideas. This, this is the one from Roslera, which has a, a, a heat ring that uses geothermal um, sources to store energy and to, and to deplete in winter but also has photovoltaics and things. We have loads of them. This is um, one Dubrovnik. Dubrovnik was really interesting in Gruzin in Dubrovnik. And the biggest problem in Gruzin and Dubrovnik is are, are the number of um, cruise ships, these horrendous cruise ships that come in. They have eight or nine a day coming in. And each one is 2,500 people living like Americans times two. So imagine, so it's, so it's like having 5,000 times 8, 40,000 Americans turning up in your, in your neighborhood every single day and trashing it, which is what's happening. So we invented this um, algae array that floated offshore, which, the, 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 um, which could provide fuel for this cruise ship, but also process all their gray water, because they just throw out, once they get offshore, they just throw out all the crap from all those people straight into the sea. And then that allowed us to, to generate energy for the neighborhood as well with a range of things. So I think that's a really <coughs> interesting project. You can read about that in, in um, a journal article we've done. Um, the last one I was just going to mention was Design for Future Climate. We, we have some money from the British government for the Technology Strategy Board to look at climate change adaptation for buildings. And what I, and what I found out absolutely terrified me. I don't know if you can see here, we've got, these are the 
psychometric charts for now in England, and this green is the comfort zone. So you see we've got minus five here, and then every now and again, if we're really lucky, we get an hour above 20 degree, 25 degrees C. And then this is, this is 2050, and now suddenly there's no cold days, no snow anymore, no frost, and you can see there's hundreds of days, hundreds of hours, some right up at 38 degrees centigrade. This is in Manchester. <laughs> it's spooky. And actually, when you look at the summer there, the summer is the same as Nice in France, almost, almost perfectly. And so we, I didn't think that the original facade on the building, I didn't design this horrible thing, I was given it, um, would survive. It was built, it was passive house design. You know, I just think, that's not going to work in this sort of condition. So I thought, if I could take off the facade and put on an irrigated loggia, which did, because this is quite dry here, generally, I could then use transpirational cooling to keep the building warm. And we'd use the, this sort of diaphragm wall between the apartments, the for old people, as a sort of chimney to draw the air through and out. And then when you get to 2080, well, it's just getting crazy. <coughs> Welcome to the future. And these are IPC, IPCC numbers, which aren't really, they're only based on a medium carbon scenario, which we've already exceeded. So, that, so it'd be worse than this. As you can see, this summer is now the same as Casablanca. God knows what it's like in Casablanca. <laughs> But what you realise, Casablanca is going to be in Manchester because there isn't going to be a Casablanca. Um, and, and so this, what we did now, I unclipped this facade and reassembled some of the components into these, into these solar chimneys that now draw air through these ground cooling pipes up the diaphragm wall into the flats and then use this to pull all the air out. And so all we've had to do, do so far since we got the design is we've, we've made this diaphragm wall construction and made a, a a cross wall construction for the apartments, which is a change, and we we put the pipes in under the ground, ready for in the foundations as part of the foundation, ready for the ready for the future. Because no one's going to pay to design a building for 2080 now, but uh, so we need to design much more adaptable buildings. Wow! So just to just to finish off, really. Um, I do worry about us all having the same idea all the time. You know, I, I think when you looked around the conference, I kept thinking everyone's sort of doing the same thing, and yet we live in so many different places. I think, I think even in the places that I'm in, I want to see a biodiversity of solution. Then we don't have to worry whether the right solution. If we do lots of different solutions, some of them will definitely work. And that's what that's really what Kevin Kelly talks about the nine laws of God. That he says. You know, nature just chucks stuff <coughs> out there and sees if it works, and it, and it and it sort of honors its errors. It says, "Yeah, it doesn't work. Let's go on with doing something else." What it doesn't do is say, "Keep trying to test what to do and not do anything." You know, we've had 25 years knowing climate change is coming, yet we haven't done anything about it because we're still wondering what to do. It would, wouldn't it have been better to have started planting trees 25 years ago and having a, having 50% more trees on the planet now. But we didn't, we kept going, do trees really work? I'm not sure if they work. I think we'll have to test that again. Maybe they do work, maybe we need, maybe they work 10%. Oh uh, yeah, but that, that calculation said nine. Ooh, I don't know, oh, maybe we need to redo the calculation. You know, I, we just need to get on with things. And as designers, we should know that. We always take risks with a very small amount of knowledge. And we, we use, because intuition counts and imagination counts. We, we make things happen. And so, you know, and I hope that that holistic thinking can can really help us sort of see cities as as these amazing phenotypes, superorganisms that sort of that sort of dwell in the landscape rather than get imposed on the landscape. I'm going to leave you with a fantastic quote, uh, which isn't even about sustainability, but it's a really good quote. So <laughs> I thought I'd end with it. But, and it's actually, a, it, it's by Carl Schroeder, who's a sci-fi writer. And he said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from nature. Basically, either advanced alien civilizations don't exist, or we can't see them because they're indistinguishable from natural systems. I vote for the latter. So we've been visited.
<laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you, Greg. It was uh, amazing. Yeah. Um, thanks a lot. Drinks or questions? In that order. Questions or drinks? Yeah. <laughs> Or both. Any, any 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 relationship with those. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anyone who wants after this <laughs> want to ask a question? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. uh, or have a comment or whatever. Say anything. Where do you get your ideas from? Um, I think I get the idea I, I think because 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 I fell through a, a window when I was Fine. I lost my right eye, so my left hemisphere of the brain thinks it's asleep all the time. So I'm just dreaming with one half of my brain. And so that's how that's how my ability comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Greg. Thank you for this fantastic talk.